Right, tonight's lecture. The spade unearths the truth. Is the Bible fact or fiction? Was one of the statements on a Time magazine not so long ago. Is the Bible fact or fiction? Well, the critics used to say that the Bible is a book of myths and that we can safely ignore it. But the Bible makes some incredible claims and uh, these claims are either mythology or they are facts that can be substantiated. This Bible has been attacked over hundreds of years and the fact of the matter is that this Bible is still around. Isn't that right? It's still there. Some people use it as a doorstop. Some people never take it off the shelf. But it is the biggest bestseller that there is and probably one of the most understood, misunderstood as well. Which is rather sad. Because the critics always have a field day when it comes to the Bible. Voltaire you know the time period? Roughly around about the French Revolution there? He said, I'm tired of hearing people repeat that 12 men established the Christian religion. I will prove that one man may suffice to overthrow it. Amazon the Fire, page 15. So this attack on the Bible is not something new. I mean, everything has been done to destroy that Bible. It was a banned book. It was destroyed in fires. If you possessed it, you were subject to a death penalty. And yet the Bible is still around. And precisely where this man, Voltaire, uttered these words, today there is one of the biggest Bible depositories in the world. <laughs> sort of saying to him, no matter what you say, I have something else to say to you. <laughs> Second Peter 1 verse 19 says, We also have a more sure word of prophecy, Whereunto you do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So the Bible claims to be a prophetic book. Is that correct? Yes. It says that you do well to take heed of the prophecies in the Bible. And we need to look at these prophecies meticulously. We cannot speculate on the prophecies. We have to look at them meticulously and we have to ask the Bible to interpret itself so that our own speculations do not come into the issue. And that's what we want to do in some of the future lectures. Let the prophecies interpret themselves and you will be stunned because a lot of the Bible deals with our time. It deals with history as well. But a lot of it deals with our time. So the Bible lays claim to be a prophetic book. But it also claims that it is a historic book. Because there are many, many historic facts in the Bible that until the science of archaeology came about were known only from the Bible and from nowhere else. For example, the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah, the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all these interesting events were recorded in the Bible but were known from no other source until the Ebla tablets were found. And that's in my lifetime. And there were recorded the very names that the critics had said didn't exist. So the Bible as a historic document has been attacked over and over again but the science of archaeology, which by the way is not more than a hundred years old, has vindicated the Bible at every turn. Yeah. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Isaiah 42 verse 9. So the Bible says that God prophesied about things in the past, the former things, and they did come to pass. And then it says, I declare to you things that will still come. And before they come, I tell you about them. So prophecy applies to all ages. You know, it would seem unfair for God to give a prophetic book to all generations if that prophetic word was only to apply to one generation. Isn't that so? 
The Bible is for all ages, for all times. So there are prophecies of past events and there are prophecies of future events. Of course, we are particularly interested in what the Bible says about the latter days. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. That's quite a challenge. So the Bible throws out the gauntlet. It says, I challenge you on this issue, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9 and 10. So God says the Bible is apart, sets it apart from every other document of religious writings in the world because it lays claim to being prophetic because the author is the one who knows the future. That's quite incredible. John chapter 5 verse 39 tells us something else about the scriptures. So we've now discovered that the Bible lays claim to being a prophetic book and we know that the Bible has historic facts in it and lays claim to the accuracy of its historic record. And then it also, in John 5, 39, says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And this is Jesus Christ speaking. This same Jesus Christ claims that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that nobody comes to the Father except by him? him. So now we are at an impasse. Because there are many that claim that there are many ways to come to the Father. In fact, here is the claim that the scriptures are not so much about events and not so much about prophecy, but are actually about an individual. So the scriptures are a road map to salvation. And salvation is centered in a person. So those are the three aspects that the Bible deals with. Salvation found in a person, Jesus Christ, historic records, and prophetic records. Now the Bible says you do well to study the prophecies, but the prophecies cannot save you. And the historic record cannot save you either. But what they can do is strengthen your faith. That the rest of the Bible can also be true. Because if the creation account, if the creation account is a myth, an unbelievable fairy tale, and the historic record is not accurate, and prophecy means very little, then how much faith can you have in the rest of the scriptures? None whatsoever. So we've dealt now with the the origins question. Tonight I want to deal with the basis of the prophetic question and I want to particularly deal with the historicity of the Bible. Those three aspects. Luke chapter 24 verse 44 and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be must be fulfilled, which were written in the Law of Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and in the Prophets, that's all the prophetic books, and in the Psalms concerning me. Now that's very interesting, because people today want to cut off the Old Testament and walk around with the New Testament, and say that that's all that is necessary. But what does it say here? The whole of the Scripture is referring to whom? Christ. To Christ. So surely that's also important that we study those in conjunction with the New Testament. The New Testament is their expositor, the explainer of the old. So we need them both. Now let us have a look at some of the most unlikely stories in the Bible that have been criticized by the critics and the higher critics in particular, people that uh, disseminated the Bible and said that this portion is not true, the creation account is not true, and then if a prophet referred to that, well then that is mythology, then in the end there was so much mythology that you're sitting with virtually nothing left 
of your Bible that you could trust in. So I want to take you to Egypt and have a look at some of the issues there. This is the step pyramid at Saqqara and it uh, dates from the third dynasty 2750 BC Pharaoh Sosa step pyramid to Saqqara. And when I was a kid when I was a kid and we did history at school then we were taught that the history of the Egyptians is thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. Is that correct? And that other dynasties on this planet were tremendously old. And then as archaeology started digging up the stones, that time period has been cut and cut and cut again. Because we find that many of the kings that they put into chronological sequence actually co-reigned. Father and sons reigning at the same time. So the time came down, 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 down. And the biblical time periods that were offered in the scriptures which were ridiculed now seem more than plausible. Today, any respectable archaeologist when it comes to Egyptology and he wants to put the year 3000 BC, he wouldn't do it without putting a plus minus in front of that. So, times have really changed because in the past 6,000, 7,000, even 10,000 was not unusual. There's a story of, of Joseph in the Bible where this little Hebrew boy gets into a position second in line after Pharaoh himself. And of course people say, well that's a ridiculous story. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. I'm not going to go through the details of the story, you know the story. Joseph was sold by his brothers, he ended up uh, being a servant in Potiphar's house. Eventually he was accused, ended up in prison and then interpreted dreams for Pharaoh after having interpreted some dreams for some of his fellow prisoners. From the year 1780 to 1545 there was a group ruling in Egypt which was known as the Semitic Hyksos. And in this time period, who knows, something interesting could have happened and a Semite might have achieved the position that the Bible refers to when talking about Joseph. Now remember the dream, Genesis 41, 28 to 30? God has shown Pharaoh what, is he, what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. That was the story of the seven fat years and the lean years and then the story of the fat cows and the lean cows and the fat grains and the lean grains and uh, the story was well that's a nice story to boost the ego of the Jews until on the first cataract of the, the, the Nile this inscription was found in hieroglyphics and it states I collected corn I was watchful in times of sowing and when a famine arose lasting many years I distributed corn the Nile has not overflowed for a period of seven years. Herbage fails, the storehouses were built, all that was in them has been consumed. Isn't that interesting? That sort of reflects the story of the Bible. And then there's a tomb in which there was found on the one side a very thin little cow with seven lean cows on the one side and on the other, it's very poor here, but there you can see a rather fat looking cow with also reliefs along the top of fat cows. So the story has been found duplicated in the hieroglyphics as well as in tombs. But the greatest story probably in Egyptology must be the story of the Exodus. Wouldn't you agree? The Bible says that here was a nation that had become slaves and God took that nation and took it out of Egypt, flattening the country in ten plagues and then finally marching those people through the Red Sea. Can you believe that? Now that is a story that you do not find in the archives of Egypt. But let me tell you something about the mindset of the Egyptians. They were much like the Russians. The Russians used to say if one of their spacecraft exploded by accident they would say 
we've had a successful test of an explosive device in space. <laughs> That's what they used to say in the past. Now, Pharaoh was a reincarnation of Horus. So he was a god. And he was invincible. And gods don't fail. So if Pharaoh came up against something that he couldn't deal with, well that was hushed up. It was never recorded in Egyptology. Only the positive events were recorded. So a story like the Exodus is a story that you would not find written in the annals of Egyptian history. So we have to play Sherlock Holmes. We have to look behind what is written to see if the story is perhaps covered up. And we have to look at the events surrounding Egyptology to see if the events actually match. Now who of you watched the movie Moses? The Walt Disney movie. Well, there are a couple who watched that. And you will remember that in that movie Moses was placed next to which pharaoh? Ramesses the second, right? And they were great buddies and grew up together and all these interesting stories. And that is the story that is pumped out to the world time and time again. Ramesses was the pharaoh of the Exodus and that is based on the name Ramesses for a town where there were Israelites involved in the building. But the biblical chronology, the biblical chronology doesn't favor Ramesses at all. In fact, it excludes Ramesses. The biblical chronology of 1 Kings chapter 6, where it tells the exact year in relationship to the reign of Solomon of when the Exodus took place, places the Exodus in the year 1450 BC. And that was long before Ramesses. In fact, it places it slab bang into the 18th dynasty and not into the time of Ramesses. And either we believe the biblical chronology that goes along with the story, or we don't. And we have to look which one fits better. So let's have a look at that 18th dynasty. Here you have one of the great pyramids, and down there you have the Sphinx, and all of these tell an interesting story. Particularly that Sphinx tells an interesting story. We'll be dealing with that. Ezekiel chapter 32, 15, When I shall make the land of Egypt desolate, and the country shall be destitute of that whereof it was full. There was a prediction that even later, Egypt would eventually experience a tremendous decline. Well, here's an article out of Time magazine, The Return of the Golden Calf. A newly found calf left in the size of a human hand, far smaller than the golden idol. Uh, in Cecil DeMille's 1956 film, The Ten Commandments. So they say, well, there's credibility. A figurine backs the tale of Moses and the idolatrous Israelites. Well, we all know today that the Israelites worshipped uh, the apis bull in the form of Hathor, female deity. The apis bull, or the female form, Hathor, with the solar disk between the horns, representing the moon and the womb of the woman. So that was common practice. Also, they had serpents in their worship, and they had features of their worship which were actually akin to what the other nations also had. Here you have covering serpents with the solar flares over their heads and the wings of serpents and a serpent worship was very prominent in Egyptology and you have Isis worship because you had a trinity in Egyptology as well you had Isis and Horus and Seb and they formed the trilogy of gods Egypt was famous for the female deity, Isis. Very interesting stuff. I'll be dealing with some of this in a later lecture, so I won't go into greater detail. Here is the symbol of Osiris. He was the one who died and then returned to earth via Isis as Horus. So that was the sort of Egyptology. And then there was the teachings of the underworld and uh, occultism which was associated with it.
They also believed in the God of the dead. This is he, Anubis. He is a form of Osiris. He is the one that weighs in the balances and sees whether you are found wanting or not. Of course, it's a system based on salvation by works. And here you have a typical Isis picture with the two covering serpents on either side. And the Egyptians believed that God was manifested in all things. So it's a form of pantheism. So God would be in the water, it would be in the river, God would be in the animals, God would be even in the dung beetles, the scarab beetle. And all of these creatures were worshipped. The frog was worshipped. And it's interesting when you look at the plagues that God actually used their very symbols and showed his superiority over all of them, over the Nile, over the frogs, over all of these creatures that were worshipped in Egyptology. Pharaohs were greater than life. They were gods. They never did anything wrong. They were supernaturally powerful. Here's the great Isis temple. Isis worship was very, very popular in Egyptology. And the pyramids were basically grand tombs later on. The tombs were transferred to the Valley of the Kings, and we'll be going there in this lecture. So what can we learn about the hidden agenda in this Egyptology? Well, nobody knew much about what history recorded. Until this stone, the Rosetta Stone, was found when Napoleon invaded Egypt. 1799, this stone was found. There it is. It's life-size. You can see it's quite a large stone, judging by that person on the side there. It's in the British Museum at the moment in London. And it had three languages on it. Amongst them was, was a Greek language and Demotic Egyptian and then the hieroglyphics. And a man by the name of Champollion studied for 22 years to decipher these writings. And then for the first time we could look into the tombs and find out what the story behind these mummies really was. And uh, some fascinating stories and some fascinating mummies. The hieroglyphics are a picture language. So, and it's also a phonetic language so that if you wanted to talk about a particular issue like belief, then they would have a leave or something like that, of course, in terms of their language. Stellas, very interesting also. They were symbols of Osiris. And in the mythology, when Isis put Osiris, who had been killed together again, there were certain portions missing, and uh, this was to represent those portions. And here you have Pharaoh always victorious in whatever he undertakes. Here's another symbol of Egyptian deities. And this is the god Amun, who is also depicted as a ram. And there are interesting parallels here, which we will look at in some detail in the future. If you've been to Egypt, it really is a fascinating country. This is the temple structures that you have down in the Valley of the Kings at Karnak. And this is typical Egyptology. If you look at these hieroglyphics, you can read these. Normally they were read, read backwards. This particular one is interesting because you can read it forward and backwards. So you had an insect like a bee and a leaf. And then you had an ankh, which is the sign of life. And you have the same repeated that way. So you could read it this way or that way. The scarab beetle, of course, one of the principal forms of the deity, as well as other animals. So just something interesting. When they showed Pharaoh, they always showed him in massive relief. And you will see that the females were not that important. Sorry, ladies. You see, this female over here, she was probably a queen or one of the concubines. Seldom were they depicted as higher than knee height. And Pharaoh himself was bigger than life. Isn't that interesting? Now, let's bring you to the story of the Exodus. Ramesses, this is he, is the one that is favored by the popular media. 
but unfortunately it's too late for the biblical chronology. So on the grounds of the biblical chronology, I'm going to reject him. I'm going to accept the biblical chronology, which puts it at 1450, the Exodus, way before this man. And we have to ask ourselves whether 1450 BC shows any interesting relationship in terms of a pharaoh that might have died in that year. By the way, by the time you get to Ramesses, I want you to notice that the queen is again less than knee height. Do you see that? The queen is left less than knee height. So in these early pharaohs, the female deities and were greatly revered, but the people were kept well below knee height. And by the time of Ramesses, you have exactly the same thing happening. Now the Exodus tells the story of this little boy Moses who was put up on the Nile. So let's have a look at Moses' chronology. He was born in 1530 BC, so that also puts him outside the time of Ramesses. Then he fled in 1490 BC, remember we count backwards because we're dealing with BC, and uh, the Exodus, if you study the biblical writings, was on the 17th of March, 1450. 17th of March, 1450. This is according to First Kings and other chronological uh, subjects in the Bible. Now there's a pharaoh that died then, and his name was Tutmosis III. And according to his scribe, Amenap, and according to the Egyptian writings, he died on the 17th of March, 1450. Now isn't that interesting? So we have a dead pharaoh precisely when the Bible says a pharaoh died in the Red Sea. Very interesting. Something else about this pharaoh that I might tell you. Tutmosis III is called the Napoleon of Egypt. He was the mightiest pharaoh that ever lived. He was a massive conqueror. He was a giant of his age. And something else about that pharaoh that's interesting. He wrote, or was associated with it, he was the overlord of the Book of the Dead. In other words, the Egyptian Bible of occultism and what happens in the afterlife. So, paganism and the pagan religion flourished under Tutmosis III and reached its heyday under this pharaoh. So we have the mightiest pharaoh of all time and we have the one who is most steeped in his religion and is the father of that religion in a sense. Actually a perfect match for God and occultism to meet on the playing field. Because God is no sissy. He won't choose the weakest pharaoh, would he? No. To show his power. So let's have a look at some of the interesting things about this 18th dynasty. Let's have a look at who it entails. Amosa, which means the moon is born. Please note that their names also end in Moser, Moses. 1517 to 1553 is too early. It's before the time of Moses. Then you have Amenhotep I. He reigned, by the way the word Amenhotep means Amun, the deity, is pleased. So this pharaoh is dedicated to the god Amun. Now he reigned from 1553 to 1532, but that was before Moses' time, because remember the date? 1530. So he was just two years before that. So I'll tell you who was born in his time. The brother of Moses, Aaron, was born then because he was three years older than Moses. So he falls within the time period of this pharaoh. Interesting, because he was not subject to a death decree. But the next pharaoh is Tutmosis the first. And they, they vary. So it's an Amenhotep and then sometimes it's a Tutmosis and then an Amenhotep again and then a Tutmosis again. And he reigned from 1532 to 1508, counting backwards. Does Moses fall into his category? Yes or no? Yes. Slab bang. Slab bang. And the interesting thing is that he had a daughter and her name was Hat Shepsut. 
So we have a pharaoh with a princess. And he falls in the time when Moses was born. So, if that is correct, then this pharaoh must be the one that issued the death decree against the, first, the sons of the Israelite women. Is that correct? Okay. And we will have to look at this princess, Hatshepsut, where she fits into the story. Well, the next pharaoh was Tutmosis II. Now he was the husband of Hatshepsut. And theoretically, the husbands of the females did not come into line to be pharaoh. So there's something very interesting over here. This fellow Tutmosis I had a daughter. And if the Bible is correct, then this daughter adopted whom? Moses. Moses. So then there was a son in line to be Pharaoh, but the son did not become Pharaoh. The husband of Hatshepsut became the next Pharaoh, and he only reigned for four years, 1508 to 1504. Now the Bible says that Moses was offered the rank of Pharaoh, is that right? But he refused, rather choosing to suffer with his people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So there are two time periods when this could have happened. It could have been at that stage or it could have been at this stage over here. And then there's something else that's interesting. Hatshepsut didn't reign alone. When her husband died, she took the throne. And she's one of the few female pharaohs in Egypt. Now of course, Pharaoh was a reincarnation of Osiris, who was a male. He was a representation of Horus, who was a male. So no female could be Pharaoh. And in order to become a Pharaoh as a woman, you had to become an honorary male. So if they had a statue of Hatshepsut, then she would have a beard. Because she was an honorary male in order to be Pharaoh. But she was co-ruling with another guy who was called Tutmosis III. Now here's an interesting story. So that Tutmosis III over there ruled together with Hatshepsut, but who was he? He was the illegitimate son of Tutmosis II, who was Hatshepsut's husband. So this guy had a fling on the side. Oh, okay. And he had a son, and this son was to become Tutmosis III. So Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III co-ruled. She was the one who probably found, found Moses, and this is the one that condemned Moses. Then we go to Amenhotep II. He was the son of Tutmosis III, and we'll come to that in a moment. And then we go to Tutmosis IV, and that also is an interesting story. Right, let's have a look at this dynasty. This is thunderous stuff. There you have a statue, or a, a head, figurehead, of Hatshepsut. One of the few around. This one is in the museum at Berlin, in the Pergamon Museum. You see she has the honorary beard over there. And most of the statues of Hatshepsut have been destroyed. Some of them were found hidden in a ditch that had been covered up so they'd broken down her statues and they defaced everything in Egypt which concerned Hatshepsut. So here was a pharaoh that history tried to rub out. To take a big rubber and to rub out the history and say this pharaoh didn't exist. This pharaoh doesn't fall in line with what we stand for. But she was a powerful ruler, no doubt about it. Here's another figure of hers that survived, Hatshepsut, the famous female pharaoh. And this is uh, her co-ruler, Tutmosis III, the one who was the chief occultist who wrote the book of the dead. And here he is depicted defeating the armies of the Assyrians, and you can see he's taking the whole army by the scruff of the hair and picking them up. And there you can see him walking over the soldiers, trampling them underfoot. 
Egypt, showing that he was a mighty, mighty pharaoh. And uh, I was interested to see that the archaeology was once published there in uh, Time magazine, and they had Hatshepsut over there, and they had Tutmosis III over there, and they actually put them as co-rulers. So you can find this is genuine archaeological history. Now the one, Tutmosis, he was an Amun worshipper because his son's name is Amenhotep II. Amenhotep II, and he ruled together with him. And then we go after that to another period, which is the Amarna period, when you come to another Amenhotep and another Amenhotep, and then we come to Tutankhamun, and we'll be dealing with that. Now let's get to this female pharaoh, Hatshepsut. Here is her mortuary temple. I had to climb very high hill to get to this picture. I'm very pleased with this picture. At Deir al Bari, there was her mortuary temple. And originally, of course, she had the same religious beliefs as all the others. And uh, this particular temple was dedicated to the goddess Hathor. And uh, very interesting, over here is the site where a university stood. And the Bible says that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So let's go to this particular site. There it is, the mortuary temple. Up there you have some figures up against the columns. But when you get close, you will see something interesting. Here is a relief where you have some Egyptian drawings. And then there's just something vague over here. This used to be a sculpture of Hatshepsut, but it was chopped out, completely removed and rubbed out. So Hatshepsut has been eradicated in this form. Here you have a depiction of the female form of Hathor. She was also uh, shown as a, as a cow, the, the Ipus cow with a solar disk in her head, standing on the pillar. And I want to take you to this place, also in uh, Luxor, in the south of Egypt. And there you have another picture of the gods blessing a particular pharaoh. But if you look at this picture, can you see that this one's also chiseled out of the wall? So everywhere where there was a Hatshepsut relief, they chiseled it out of the wall. They wanted to get rid of this pharaoh. Now what did Hatshepsut do that was so bad? There are still some other things about her that are interesting. This one over here, this pillar, this sun pillar is a relic depicting her father. And this one is one of herself. And let me take you to the tomb of Tutmosis the third. This is now the pharaoh that ruled at the time when Moses fled and returned. Just prior to the exodus, Hatshepsut died. In fact, she was murdered. Six years before her death, all record of Hatshepsut ceases. So the pharaoh in control, Tutmosis III, towards the latter end of her reign, had her eliminated and he had her prime minister sacked. So her whole cabinet was sacked and Tutmosis III took over as the main ruler towards the end of her life, and then he had Hatshepsut and her cabinet killed. All of them were murdered, and Tutmosis III lived alone. Now the Bible tells us that Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh. Now there were two Pharaohs ruling. One was Hatshepsut, who was probably his stepmother, and the other one was this guy. So which one did he flee from? He probably fled from this one, right? Tutmosis III. And then the Bible says, while he was in exile, he got news that Pharaoh had died. Which one died? Hatshepsut died. And then he said he was afraid to go back because he was afraid of Pharaoh. Which one was he afraid of? This one. So by the time that Moses returned from exile, Hatshepsut was dead. Her history was eliminated from Egypt. Her statues were defaced. 
and every relief of hers was chiseled out of the walls. And this Pharaoh alone ruled. Now the Bible says that when he confronted this Pharaoh, there was a match. Do you remember that? And Moses was told to throw his staff, and his staff turned into a what? Into a serpent. And what did the sorcerers at the court of Pharaoh do? What does the Bible say? Took their staff, threw them, and they also turned into serpents. But then the serpent, which was Moses' staff, ate the others up to show his superiority. Now let me take you to the tomb of Tutmosis III. Here it is. And uh, I was privileged to walk this mountain. It's quite a high mountain to his tomb. And if you go to the Egyptian museum, you will find a mummy of Tutmosis III. Now, this is very interesting. There's a mummy that was found in that tomb, and there it is, Tutmosis III. But Tutmosis III must have been an old man by the time he died. Because he was the illegitimate son of Hatshepsut's husband. Do you remember that? So he must have grown up in the court with Moses, and Moses was how old when he returned? 80. 80. So how old was this guy, more or less? Probably in the same region. Now, the Bible says that the army, the entire army of Pharaoh at its head, was destroyed in the Red Sea. But there's this mummy in the Egyptian museum, and there it is. And then, I think it was 1973 or 1976, one of those two dates, Two scientists by the name of Harris and Weeks studied this mummy with X-ray technology. And guess what they found? They found that this was the mummy of a young man. And not of an old man, so it is a fake mummy. It is a fake mummy. It cannot be the mummy of Tutmosis III. It is of a young man. Is it possible that the Egyptians had lost their pharaoh and that they had to put a substitute in his place because how can you admit to the fact that you lost your pharaoh in the Red Sea? Not only that, let's go into his tomb. Here it says, the great conqueror who ruled Egypt from 1504 to 1450 BC, this stands at his tomb, contains inscriptions from the book of the hereafter. He's the one who set on paper Egyptian occult religion. I'm going to take you into this tomb and I'm going to show you something interesting. Well here you have typical sun worship, the scarab beetle being worshipped with the open hands, symbol of sun worship. And look at this. When I found this I was so excited. Here you have one of the priests of Hathor. There he is, not this is a priest of um, Horus, sorry with a circle with a dot in it, which is another interesting occult symbol with a serpent on it. And he's got his staff in his hand and it's like he's throwing it. Can you see that? And in front of him there stands a serpent. Isn't that interesting? That's exactly what the Bible says what happened at the showdown. The serpent coming from the staff of the priests. In fact this whole tomb is full of serpents and there you have Pharaoh also with a serpent standing in front of him. So the whole tomb shows this relief of serpents and staffs being thrown and turning into serpents. Now the interesting thing is that this Pharaoh also co-ruled with his son. And that son's name was Amenophis or Amenhotep is the other name for him. Two. Amenhotep II. And there's his tomb. There is being given life by the Ankh because the Pharaoh went into the afterlife as a, a reincarnation and his soul was released into the afterworld with all his servants. By the way, it was a tough job to be a servant of Pharaoh. When Pharaoh died, his entire staff was killed to serve him in the afterworld. So it wasn't a good job to have. Here, by the way, you have some interesting reliefs from that book of the underworld and you have the whole story of sun worship, the rise and the meridian and the fall. These are the actual tombs. Now, this is the story. This pharaoh, Tutmosis III, is the one that died 
in the exact time when the Bible says he should have died and there's a fake mummy of his. But his son, who is shown over here, is Amenhotep II. And this pharaoh was not in, Palestine, was not in Egypt at the time, but was in Syro-Palestine. With quite a part of the Egyptian army, he was suppressing an uprising. And for that reason, Pharaoh, with his whole entourage, had moved up to the delta region of the Nile. That's fascinating. So there they were all up there. So the confrontation that took place between Moses and Pharaoh didn't take place at Luxor in the south, but took place at the delta where Tutmosis III was waiting for his son to return, Amenhotep II, who was away with the bulk of the army suppressing an uprising. It's interesting that the Bible says that God did not take the Israelites along the short route lest they face war and become afraid. Because this Pharaoh would have been on his way back at the time when God intervened. And he took his people through the Red Sea and that Pharaoh died. Now by the way, what happened in the 10th plague? Do you know what happened in the 10th plague? All the what in Egypt died? All the firstborn in Egypt died. Now this particular Pharaoh over here, he was not in Egypt at the time. He was in Cy Syro-Palestine. But his son, his firstborn son, was in Egypt. And that firstborn son must have died. Now let's pick up the story. The history tells us, and the hieroglyphics tell us, that when this Pharaoh returned from Syro-Palestine, it was three months after the Exodus. And when he returned, he went ballistic. He went totally ballistic. He went through that country with his army, destroying whole cities. Now how would you feel if your American army returned triumphant from a war and came and flattened all the countries, all the cities in your country? How would you feel about that? Would you be excited? Probably not. Now why would a pharaoh do that? He was wiping out relics of what remained of the Israelites and relics of what remained of Hatshepsut and in fact he actually took the heads of some of his captives and put them on the boat to show his strength and his power and in this particular caption over here it says all is well in my kingdom all is at rest very interesting because nothing was well in his kingdom and nothing was at rest but the plot thickens. Here at the Sphinx we pick it up. There's a stella down there between the legs of the Sphinx and on it is written something about the next Pharaoh who would succeed that previous one, Amenhotep II. And he was again, of course, not Amenhotep but a Tat Moses. So he was Tat Moses IV. And there it stands on the stella that Tat Moses IV was the second born son of the previous Pharaoh. Now that's a problem, because who should have been the Pharaoh? The firstborn. So now why would the secondborn be the next Pharaoh? Well, the first one was dead. But how do you explain that to posterity? Well, it stands over there. If you read the hieroglyphics on the stella, it says the following. Tadmoses IV was resting there between the legs of the Sphinx, when he heard the Sphinx say to him, Tadmoses, Please remove the sand from between my legs and I will see to it that you, the second born, becomes the next pharaoh instead of the first born. That's what it says on that stella. So if you want to believe that, that's fair enough. Personally, I believe it's a cover-up to show that the first born was actually dead and they needed an excuse to show why the second born was actually the next pharaoh. Now. Did many of the Egyptians change their religion at that time, yes or no? Yes, because the Bible says that many of the Egyptians gave their money freely to the Israelites and many of them sought shelter during the plagues and that God would protect them if they sought shelter under the blood on the doorposts. Is that right? Okay, so if this event is true, then surely some big tumultuous change must have taken place in Egypt 
round about this time. Here is the tomb of Tutmosis IV, and uh, that's an interesting pharaoh. That's the one. There's the second born, and there is his particular tomb. It's still the same as all the other Egyptian tombs, and uh, you still have the goddesses guarding the entrails and the body of the departed pharaoh. Now the next one becomes interesting. The next pharaoh, who must have been the child growing up with his father, who was the second born, he was Amenhotep III. Now this pharaoh is very interesting because Amenhotep III changed his religion or started to change his religion. And there is a relief of Amenhotep III and he too is chiseled out of the wall. Isn't that interesting? So here's another pharaoh that has to be rubbed out of history. Why? He had a son who was to be the next Amenhotep and uh, he changed his name. He didn't want to be called Amun, his please. So he changed his name to Akhenaten. Now, Akhenaten ends in Aten. And that literally means that this pharaoh changed his religion from the worship of Amun to the worship of Aten. And Aten was a monotheistic god. So the Egyptian religion was rejected. Now this is Akhenaten. Very strange pharaoh. Look at him over here with his rather strange face and his pot belly. Do you see that? This pharaoh said, don't make me bigger than life. Make me just like I am. I'm an ugly duckling. Show me as an ugly duckling. Realism started coming in. Let's see what happened to the women. Well, here you have Artenism. And some believe that Artenism was the worship of the sun. It wasn't. The sun just was a symbol of this particular deity, Aten. And there you have Akhenaten kissing his wife. That was unheard of in Egyptology under the rays of Aten. Now his wife's name was Nefertiti. She was the famous Nefertiti. Something else here. Here you have Akhenaten with his little pot belly over there sitting opposite his wife over there Nefertiti and he's holding his two little kids in his arms and he's kissing them and there's another little child. Those are his three daughters. One of these daughters' name is Anken Senpaten. It ends, ends in Aten. Did you know that this pharaoh, Akhenaten, wrote a psalm? He wrote a poem of which 17 verses are taken from one of the psalms of Moses. How do you like that? So which god was he serving? Which God was he serving? If he quotes a psalm of Moses, he must have been serving the Israelite God. So here are a couple of pharaohs that have been wiped out. Hatshepsut. Do you think it's possible that Hatshepsut changed her religion? And that is why she was removed from the history books? Then you have a cover-up, you have a fake mummy saying that a pharaoh is there when he's not really there. And then you have a second born one and you had a son of the first one going berserk in his country when he returned. And then you have a change of religion in Egypt, so much so that they didn't even want to live in Luxor, which was associated with the pagan religion. And this pharaoh, Akhenaten, shifted his capital to the other side so that it wouldn't be Eastern worship. And he built a totally new capital where he served his god and he called his capital Akhetaten. Also ends in Aten. So you have Akhenaten with Nefertiti and the daughter Ankensenpaten living in Akhetaten. See, everything ends in A. It's quite cute. There you go. Now, what's interesting is that this pharaoh is also removed from history. His whole family, he and his wife are murdered. They're murdered. 
but the daughters survive. And the one that survives in particular is Anken Sen Paten. Now there's Nefertiti, the few things that are found of hers, some of them are unfinished, and again these reliefs were broken and smashed, so you have little broken pieces in the various museums of the world, particularly in Germany. But this pharaoh is removed from history. And thereafter only do we get to Ramesses when the old pagan religion is reinstalled. Now, let's look at the next pharaoh. There he is. His name originally, when he became pharaoh, was called Tut. Ank Aten. Tut, Ank, life, Aten. Aten gives life to this pharaoh. So his name was Tut Ank Aten, and he was married to the daughter of Akenaten, who was, remember, Anken Sen Paten. And there they are. This is the famous uh, royal chair of Aten. But there were two royal chairs, and the other one had a different name. Very sad story. This particular pharaoh could only remain pharaoh if he changed his name. And so he changed his name. He changed his name from Tut Ankh Aten to Tut Ankh Amun. Tutankhamun. Does he ring a bell? Tut Ankh Amun. So what does that tell us about his religion? He changed his religion. He changed his religion from the worship of Aten to the worship of Amun. And his wife, her name was, do you remember that? Ankensen Paten. She changed her name to Ankensen Amun. So what did she do with her religion? She changed her religion. Well, this pharaoh only ruled for a very short while, and this is the famous death mask of Tutankhamun, Tut Ankamun, and with his death or buried in his royal tomb, there were found all the reliefs of ancient paganism back in there. There you have the famous Anubis, you have the serpents, and you have the symbols of Isis, the eagle, and you have the goddesses guarding his entrails. There you are. And uh, symbols of sun worship, various deities of Egypt, and the statues of these two at Luxor tell a sad story because their names are Ankensen Amun and Tut Ank Amun. They could have been Tut Ank Aten and Ankensen Paten forever and worship the one God, but they changed their religion for the sake of riches. Let me tell you something else. When this pharaoh died, this woman was left destitute. Nobody helped her. In fact, here was a queen without any assistance. So she wrote a letter to the king of the Hittites and says, please send me one of your sons that I may not be alone in this embarrassment. And he sent a letter back and he said to her, get lost. Isn't that interesting? So they had a very sad ending. Sometimes it's worthwhile clinging to truth rather than giving up. By the way, this letter to the Hittites is interesting because the critics said there, was, there were no Hittites. Only the Bible recorded the Hittites. But then they found the Hittites. The Ebla tablets tell the story of all the ancient kingdoms that are recorded in the Bible, spot on. So I want to tell you something. I believe that the story of the Exodus is spot on, and that there is more than enough substantial e evidence or in the history of Egypt to show that the Bible is right after all. And when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, you remember that earth-shattering experience when this little boy this little guy with the name of Muhammad Ed Deep, he was traveling around with his, with his sheep, and one of the sheep was loaded, probably had some drugs on it, and they sh chased the sheep over the borders, and that's how they deal with their drugs. He, one of those got lost, so he threw a stone into the caves, 
and you heard pottery crash and then they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they thought that finally they have the Bible nailed down because surely these scrolls would be proof that the Bible has changed since that time. Well every single book except the book of Esther has been found and you know what every single one of the books in the Bible all the snippets are exactly as we have today. The entire Isaiah scroll was found and that was perfect exactly like it is today. It was written by or copied by the Essenes and these people were interesting they were Gnostics so they had a lot of Egyptian mythology in their writings as well. So as far as the history of the Bible is concerned I think we can trust it 100%. The historicity of the Bible is spot on. Now what about prophecy? Let me take you to an ancient prophecy to show you how accurate the Bible is. This is an island city called Tyre. And here were Phoenician traders that lived over here and they were mighty. They were mighty. These Phoenicians were extremely powerful. And then a prophet comes along, Ezekiel, and he says, Behold, I will cause many nations to come up against thee, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. Now that's okay. You can say, well, that's easy to predict. Anybody can come along and say, I'm going to destroy your walls. We all know that wars come sooner or later, so probably it would happen. What about the religion of Tyre? Well, it was also a system of sun worship. There you have the eight-spoked sun symbol. Then you had the symbol of the sun, the moon, and the star, the three aspects of the deity. But Ezekiel goes on and he says, in verse 4 and 5, chapter 26, I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. And I shall, it shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. So the city wouldn't only be destroyed, the dust would be swept away. And today, there is no city of Tyre where it used to be. There's a new Tyre that was built on an island, and that's it, over here, an island Tyre. The prophet goes on and he says, And they shall plunder your riches and make a prey of your merchandise, and they shall break down your walls and destroy your desirable houses, and shall lay your stones and your timber and your dust in the midst of the water. So the prophet says, I'm going to take this city and I'm going to scrape it as clean as it can be, and I'm going to throw the whole city into the ocean. Now what did you do with a prophet that did that today? A prophet that would come and say, Listen, New York, you're going to drop down, you're going to be flat, and then the whole of the city will be dumped into the ocean and everything swept clean. Would you believe him or would you think he's slightly nuts? He probably thought flat and nuts. Yeah, you'd think he was slightly nuts, you're right. Now, here is a remnant of the island city of Tyre. Ezekiel says, I will make you like a shining rock. You will be a place to spread nets on. You shall be built no more, no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken, says the Lord, Jehovah. Ezekiel 26, verse 14. So it says, I will destroy the city. It will never be built again. It will be as flat as a rock. The whole city will be thrown into the sea. Now that's an ancient prophecy. And let's see if it was fulfilled to the letter. If you go to that area today, you find fishermen spreading their nets precisely where the ancient Tyre stood. And when you look into the sea, you see little remnants of it and all along this coast there is no remnant left. Now what happened to the city? Well Nebuchadnezzar was the first one who went up against Tyre and the people of Tyre barricaded themselves in and he just couldn't conquer them. Eventually many of them escaped and they built the new city of Tyre on the island and the mainland city was eventually flattened by Nebuchadnezzar. So there it lay. Flattened. A pile of rubble. The whole city. And it lay there for a quarter of a millennium. And then this man came along, Alexander the Great, and of course the mainland city of Tyre was lying there in rubble. So the prophecy that the city would be thrown into the midst of the sea was not fulfilled until the time of Alexander the Great. 
And there was this island city of Tyre, and he sent his boats to go and conquer it. But these people were clever, and they had planted spikes and timber and tree trunks with sharp edges into the ocean, and you had to know exactly how to navigate, and his ships would crash up against these and would tear up the bottom, and he lost too much of his fleet. So Alexander didn't know how to conquer this island. And then one day, he was probably standing there, and he saw the huge piles of the ancient city of Tyre. And guess what he said to his soldiers, to his army? He said, take that ancient city, there's enough material over there, put it into the ocean and build me a highway to that island. And that's what they did. They dumped the entire city of Tyre into the ocean, and then they scraped the dust off, to make a smooth highway so that he could march over and conquer the island Tyre. So the prophecy was fulfilled to the letter. So ancient prophecy, even though it defies description and seems most unusual, was fulfilled to the letter. So what does that mean in terms of prophecy concerning this day? Do you think it might be reliable as well? I think so. Today, of course, the the island is silted in and has become part of the mainland again, but the city has never been rebuilt. Mayor's ancient history says Alexander the Great, after a most memorable siege, captured the city of Tyre, that's the island city, and reduced it to ruins in BC 332. She never recovered from the blow, and the larger part of the site of the once great city is now as bare as the top of a rock. Isn't that interesting? History book. It's just about quoting scripture here. A place where fishermen who still frequent the spot spread their nets to dry. History confirms prophecy. Wow! And all you have there is little bits of pieces. God said, remember the former things forever, for I am God and no other is God, even none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the past, the things which were not yet done saying, My purpose shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God said the city would never be rebuilt. He said the same about Babylon. He said it will be a place where owls will be seen, where jackals make their, their hide, but the place will never be rebuilt. Time and again they try to rebuild Babylon. Every single time, catastrophe struck. Eventually Babylon was carried away, and has never been rebuilt. Isn't that incredible? When God says something, He means it. I want to take you to one last spot, because this is an interesting place. This is the famous Petra. And Petra means rock. And uh, this is the place where the Edomites lived. And the Edomites were the descendants of Esau. Remember the story of Jacob and Esau? And this Edomite situation built in Petra the rock is a symbol of people choosing a rock of their own making. Now the prophet Abadiah said the Lord says to Edom, that's Petra, I will make you weak, everyone will despise you, your pride has deceived you, your capital is a fortress of solid rock. The critics said there was no such city as solid rock. And so you say to yourself, who can pull me down, even though you make your home as high as an eagle's nest, so that it seems to be amongst the stars, yes, I will pull you down. So here is a description of a capital that the critics said never existed. Until an archaeologist concealed himself like a sheik, and they took him through what they call a sikh, a narrow channel, and through this sikh, he came and discovered the ancient city of Petra. This is what it looks like over there. It's a very narrow channel. You can put your hands up and touch the sides. And as you go along, you will find interesting reliefs. Here used to be an old camel. That's just the feet of the camel left. The rest is eroded away. And there was a man leading the camel. Plus you had little places of worship all along the line. And then as you come towards the end of the tunnel, and you peer through the slit in the rock, that's the first thing you see. 
That's the famous Al Khazna Temple. There's some interesting history here. This is a place that used to be a depository for the treasures of Isis. And they used to think that the treasures of Egypt were in this dome, but of course they have never found them. But this temple over here, this tomb temple, is chiseled out of solid rock. And all these tombs are chiseled out of solid rock. All the buildings are chiseled out of solid rock. The Bible said that this city would be solid rock. And this is how the people live. This is one of the typical houses chiseled out of solid rock. So they chisel it out, cover it up in the front, and uh, put in some walls. Here's a typical one as well. There's the great amphitheater and uh, massive structure. And above the amphitheater, can you see what that over there, all these holes? Those are the tombs. So if you died, they believed the best place to be was above the theater. So I guess the guests used to wear a clothes peg or something in case uh, the smell got overpowering. But uh, they knew how to entertain. It was a massive amphitheater. Here's a camel. Now why did God say this place should be destroyed? Look at the walls. Beautiful geology here as well, by the way. Well, he said, your pride has deceived you. No one fears you as much as you think you do. You live on the rocky cliffs high above in the mountains, but even though you live as high as an eagle, the Lord will bring you down. The Lord has spoken. The destruction that will come on Edom will be so terrible that everyone who passes by will be shocked and terrified. No one will ever live there again. I, the Lord, have spoken. Do you know the last some of the last occupants were? They still lived there in the time of Jesus. In fact, the king of Petra, his daughter was married to Herod. And John the Baptist is the one who said to him, Hey, why did you forsake the wife, who was this daughter of the king over here, Eritas, why did you forsake her for Philip's wife, your brother's wife? So at that time, this place was still occupied. Now, why would God say this place would have to be destroyed? Well, here's a high place. This is fascinating. And on top there, you can see a pillar. This is a Um el Bayarak, a high place. And this is a place where they worshipped and where they sacrificed. And they sacrificed virgins. They sacrificed animals, but they also sacrificed virgins. And the ritual when you find two pillars is that they worship in the form of the sun god and once a year they would take a young virgin up these steps to the top of the high place that's the view from up there and as you go up you come to the pillars there's one of them sacrificial high place by the way this is the best preserved high place in the Middle East. And here you have the two sun pillars, Dushara and al Uzza. And the story is, when the sun strikes those pillars, that's when the sacrifice was made. Now I'm going to show you the place, and we made a little video up on this place. Here's a, a place of holy water where the priests would wash their hands. Here was the slab where they put the young virgin, and then they would sacrifice her there, and process the body over there and they would place the heart into this solar disk and the blood would trickle down and uh, this is the place of processing interesting little stone over there that white one on another mountain on the other side and there's this solar disk and this is the little video we made up there I'm just going to play it for you This is the sacrificial high place here at Petra. Here they would place the heart of the human sacrifice and the blood would trickle down. Would trickle down there. And over here they would burn the body. We have the two sun pillars representing yeah. Dushara and Al Uzza. And as the sun rose in the morning and struck the top of the pillar, the sacrifice was made. Wherever we have obelisks like we have over here, the archaeology tells us that there were human sacrifices just as 
we find at Gezer in Israel, where they found the actual bodies of adults, even small children, that were sacrificed to the sun god. If you look across this valley, you can see a white stone which marks the place where Aaron is buried. And it is interesting that you have these two religions meeting in this spot. The one which requires a human sacrifice of a virgin to appease the sun god, and the other one which relies on the Lamb of God which was sacrificed for the sins of the world. Well, that's the story of the high places. When you come down from there, it's very steep, and uh, here is uh, the famous Tomb of Tears because of this formation over here. The Bedouins, they don't live there. The Bible said that this place would never be occupied again. Nobody would ever permanently live there. So it's just a tourist attraction today. Here are some of the relics that they sell. This is the famous Lion Fountain, a little fountain where the water comes down. And this was the Temple of Isis, so they had Isis worship. And here you have the lion with eagle wings. These are interesting symbols, because when you come to the prophecies of Daniel, you will find that it talks about a lion with eagle's wings as a symbol of a nation. So there you have those over there as well. And uh, these are Bedouin camels. And I want to take you to another interesting place. You go up a hill, some interesting Bedouins up there, and then you get to another temple, almost like the previous one. And it's huge. It's absolutely gigantic, and it's magnificent. It's hewn out of solid rock. There, I'm standing over there against the pillar just to show you how huge this thing is. Now guess who is buried, who was buried there? Miriam. Miriam. Now isn't this fascinating? Here you have pagan nations that take biblical prophets and bury them in these places. They wouldn't listen to the words of the prophets, but once the prophets are dead, they revere them. They even build huge structures over them and revere the dead prophets. It's as if God is being slapped twice. Once when you ignore the prophet, and secondly when you worship the prophet rather than God. Isn't that strange? So here at Petra, you have the story of two religions which meet. The story of Jacob and the story of Esau. Esau said, I will rely on a rock of my own making. And Jacob says, I will rely on the rock of my redemption. Here you have some of the ancient temples and uh, some interesting things about sun worship. Notice the three arches. And you will be surprised where we will find three arches over and over and over again in our time. Don't miss it. The two gods are totally different. The one has to be appeased, and the other one, John 14 verse 1 to 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled, you believe in God. Believe also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, what does it say? I will come again. I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am you may be also. The one is a God of love and the other one is a God of wrath. And often we tend to confuse these two. The one, the rock of the salvation says you do not need to sacrifice the lives of your children because I myself will come and die in your place. And the lamb that was used in the sacrificial system became a symbol of the Messiah to come. So John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So these two religions meet each other here in the old Edomite capital. So tonight we've seen that the Bible is trustworthy when it comes to its historic record. Would you agree with that? So we've looked at the story of the Exodus, we've seen the hidden agenda between the lines written in Egyptology, we've looked at some of the spectacular prophecies, the improbable prophecies like Tyre in the past, and did it 
come to fulfillment to the letter, yes or no? Yes. yes. And we've looked at the story of Edom, and we've seen how people make a choice. They either choose a rock of their own salvation, or they choose the rock that is able to save to the uttermost. And the choice is ours. Now, in order to establish what's happening in our times, we have to go to modern prophecies. And we will be going into those in the next lectures. Don't miss those, because they are thunderous. The detail in some of the prophecies pertaining to our time are unbelievable. Don't miss the next lectures and bring friends. This place must be too small because it's very important that we know where we stand in terms of the times we are living in. Because not that it can save you, but it can establish your faith that you can know that what is written is trustworthy, absolutely trustworthy. God bless you until we see each other again. Thank you.